Hello, hello. Thank you for joining us. I'll give it another minute or so while everybody jumps into the meeting room. Thank you for being here. For those that are joining, if you would jump in that chat and tell us where you're coming from. All right, so I'm actually going to go ahead and get started. My name is Jamie. I'm with ArcPoint Labs, and I appreciate everybody being here for our managing disclosures and explaining results um, webinar. We are definitely going to hopefully enlighten you on things about conversations that you might be having or need to have with somebody in the workplace, and also just enlighten you a little bit more on workplace and um, screening processes and the compliance piece of that as well today. So again, excited to get this stuff started. We've got two great speakers and um, ready to kick this thing off. So Megan, if you don't mind, there we go. Just as a reminder, this webinar actually does offer um, accreditation through HRCI and SHRM. So you'll be receiving a certificate if you've attended this webinar. Um, we'll get those out probably by Monday. So be looking for that in your inbox and you'll get those continuing ed credits. I also have to put out this fabulous legal disclaimer, as always, where um, an employer is, you know, a user of consumer reports. It's your responsibility to ensure compliance with the relevant federal, state, and local laws. The information presented here is just for informational purposes only. So we're not attorneys. We're not providing legal advice, but we would advise you to consult with your legal counsel regarding your policy and procedures if you need to go further in any questions that you have after today. And now we'll probably introduce here the speakers. So first up is Megan Johnson. Megan is a certified executive leadership and communications coach and has founded MLJ Coaching and Consulting out of Olympia, Washington, where she resides with her husband and young son. She holds an ACC coaching credential from International Coaching Foundation, and she has been in human resource management for over 15 years. I mean, she has sat in your seat. Megan also holds a bachelor's degree from University of Utah in sociology and criminology. Megan focuses on leadership and organizational development, self and situational awareness through Enneagram and an emotional intelligence expertise, along with communication styles and dynamics. We're lucky to have Megan as a professional coach, consultant, facilitator, and speaker today who has a passion for helping individuals and teams. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for being here. Lisa Tonioli is our next speaker. She is our manager of CRA services here at ArcPoint, and we're grateful to have her over 15 years of background screening and drug testing experience on our team. Lisa has been in so many positions within the industry, serving in roles like screening provider for over 10 years and an HR or property manager for over seven years, which means, again, she has sat in your seats, so I'm excited for her to be here. Lisa has a BEA in American Sign Language and will be obtaining her master's in data science soon. She also holds the advanced FCRA accredited uh, certification through PBSA, giving her lots of expertise in the field of screening. Lisa lives in Salt Lake City with their family, enjoys reading actual books, not just reading actual books, and hiking in the great outdoors. So I hope you enjoy this webinar day. Again, I hope it brings you some clarity on the processes, gives you helpful hints, and actually things that you can actually say to people as you experience those sometimes sensitive conversations. So ladies, I will let you take it from here. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much, Jamie. Uh, yeah. So my name is Megan, and I'm going to start out with a story from back in my HR days. So I did a lot of recruitment back then. And there I was sitting at the desk, trying to pump myself up to pick up the phone and call this individual who had been our ideal candidate. Um, it was it was a gentleman who was applying for a, I think it was a quality engineering position. And we had totally wined and dined this guy. We'd flew, flown him out. We'd taken him out on a team dinner. Um, you know, paid for a few nights in a hotel and allowed for him to do kind of a house hunting visit and all of that. And when we got the drug screen information back, we found out that he had, um, I'll actually tell you, like cocaine in his system. 
and it wasn't the 80s. This was, you know, a few years ago, not too bad. Um, but it, you know, it wasn't back in, in those, those 80s days. So I had to actually give him a phone call and let him know that he didn't meet the requirements um, when it came to um, our drug screening policy. Uh, and I had to let him know that he was no longer, um, you know, eligible for the position or not able to hire him. Um, he did come up with some sort of lame excuse. I remember, like, I think it was something like there was, like, he went to a party or someone's house that was like a bunch of drugs on the table or something like that. And I'm like, eh, yeah, nice <laughs> try. But um, yeah, that was just one of the most awkward and most difficult conversations I've had to deal with. And that's why um, Lisa and I and Art Point wanted to talk with you today because delivering that level of bad news can be really awkward and can be really difficult. Uh, so talking about like that piece of communicating those messages and also the confidence that comes from being able to have a good solid process that can help you feel more comfortable stepping into those conversations. So that's a lot of what we're talking about today is that dual piece, communicating it and making sure that you have the confidence based on being compliant and having um, all of your ducks in a row. So on a scale, I'm going to ask you a question here. On a scale of one to 10, and just put it in the chat, how good are you at delivering bad news, right? So one is horrible, five is okay, kind of somewhere in the middle, and then maybe 10, you're really good. Kind of curious with who we have in the room and how good you are at delivering bad news. Oh, some middle grounds. Monica says five, Anna six, Mike seven, who's an eight? <laughs> it's like five, six, seven, ready for the next number. Yeah. All right. So good. Oh, there we go. Cheryl. Awesome. Thanks for chiming in with the eight. I'm like, I'm, now I don't want to nine. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah. So we have some people right in the middle, right? And so that's the hope is that after today, you'll feel a little bit, you know, we're not, we're not going from a one to a 10 here. But, you know, maybe from a six to an eight or an eight to a nine or 10, right, about feeling better about delivering uh, bad news and being able to pick up that phone and, and talk to that person who is no longer going to be eligible for hire. All right. The outcomes that we're hoping for today um, are to gain a clear understanding of the importance, right, why we're talking about this, why it's important, why we care. Uh, develop some strategies for delivering this sensitive information and how to um, do that with tact, with professionalism, and with compassion, right? Because we're all human and we all make mistakes and, and we want to make sure we're delivering that in those ways. Also, um, strengthening our ability to navigate uh, and manage those, those, those conversations with confidence and assess our effectiveness of our procedures and then we're also going to give some additional resources. All right. So to jump into why we care, <laughs> why this is important, just a couple examples. The first one is a case with the EEOC and BMW. And I like to mention that for some reason I chose two car companies and I have absolutely nothing against car companies when it comes to this. It just so happened they both got in trouble recently. I don't know what it is. Like it definitely not just the car industry, it's everywhere, as we all know. So the EEOC and BMW had an issue where they had one of those policies regarding criminal background checks that was like a carte blanche rule. Like anyone with a felony over seven years um, was not eligible for employment with that company. And the problem with that was that for some reason, there was um, a group of African Americans that were not hired based under that policy, even when they disclosed, even when there'd been some communication about it, because it was that carte blanche rule, there wasn't any sort of caveat or any sort of explanation based on the job specifics or even like the job necessity. So it was kind of even kind of loosely, you know, defined roles that really, you know, you know, they disclosed the information and things like that, where they still didn't make it through. Um, the hiring process based on that carte blanche rule. And so the EEOC actually ended up, you know, really coming down on BMW and, you know, had a, a hefty fine. I don't know the actual number, but it was a huge discrimination case. And so, yeah, Lisa, did you have something to add to that? No, I was trying to remember. I looked up the number and I, I don't want to quote anything that I, 
I don't remember. I, I it was big, though, right? It, it was, was big, big. <laughs> yeah. It was big, and I, I should have wrote it down. Yeah, yeah, I know. I should have wrote it down as well. I just remember it was a big number. And the other factor with this is that it actually took seven years to get to a final verdict with this case. So BMW was having to deal with the lengthy process of being in a legal argument um, regarding this issue for seven years. So just realizing that, gosh, the time and effort and stress that would go into any sort of case like that for that length of time. The second example is a little different. It was a, a plaintiff appealant versus Ford Motor Company. And this was just such an interesting case because it was actually someone who passed away and their family was appealing the decision um, of, of paying out kind of a, or something around wrongful death, really, because they had a policy that didn't allow um, any usage of drugs or alcohol while they were working. That was their company policy. Great practice, right? If you don't want people using drugs or alcohol while they're working. Um, the issue was that they blatantly did not adhere to their policy. And this person, an employee of theirs, um, had an accident on the job, went to the hospital, found out he was under the influence. And so, and you know, so they were not adhering to or being able to address their policy. And so the um, the family of the person he ended up passing away, unfortunately, and the family actually ended up coming back around to Ford Motor Company saying that you didn't um, follow your policy. And so we wanna make sure, right? What are we learning here? That careful of carte launch policies, <laughs> right? And there's actually some legal talk, legal points that Lisa's gonna to talk to in a little bit about making sure that it is specific to the job. And then the second thing is that even when you have a policy, which is a great practice, you gotta to adhere to it, right? You have to make sure that people are following it, that people are aware of it, and that when there is a violation that people are addressing those issues. All right. So the agencies, I talked a little bit about the EEOC before, but there's several agencies that we want to be aware of when it comes to being compliant and having our, you know, having all of the policies and so forth that in our plate in place. And the first one is the FTC. So this is the Federal Trade Commission, and they are an agency that enforces antitrust, consumer protection. Uh, and really just any sort of areas around commerce. It's an entire organization within the government that monitors that. The second one is the EEOC, the situation with the BMW, and that's Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So the issue ended up being discrimination when it came to the EEOC, and that's what they watch out for, is making sure that there is, is fair laws and that people are enforcing the laws around discrimination and harassment. Then the CFPB, um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and they are kind of a single point agency that handles all things to do with like the marketplace consumer and financial laws and protecting consumers. So making sure that, that consumers are protected and that they are um, you know, not um, being manipulated or you know, abused in any way. Mm -hmm. um, FCRA is Fair Credit Reporting Act. So this is an act, a law that went into place to help people um, you know, regulate any sort of collection of reporting or credit information. So um, you know, seeking out and getting a credit report without authorization, that type of thing, that's the, the FCRA is, are the people that would come down on you know, for that. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, part of the disclaimer, right, was that every state and local area sometimes has their own laws when it comes to this. And that's often the, the areas that can change a little bit more, um, you know, like usually it takes a bigger, it's a bigger ship, right? A bigger ship to turn when it's the government, it's a little smaller ship to turn when it's the state. And so sometimes laws are a little bit more um, moving through when it comes to that. So I just have a quick question. It's just a poll, it's actually a poll. I'm just kind of curious, which area of the of these agencies that we just talked about are you paying the most attention to, right? What ones are you the most concerned with? I guess maybe that's two different questions, right? Like whether you're concerned or paying attention to, um, they really probably might want to be the same, right? But which agency do you feel like is something that that you are keeping a close eye on? FTC, EEOC, CFPB, FCRA, or state and local laws? Take a minute and choose one of those for you.
Oh, it, I'm seeing a little notice that says host. Oh, we can't vote. Oh, I can't vote. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Okay, I there we go. Can everyone see the results? Okay. So nobody cares about the FTC. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You probably care a little, just not the most. EEOC is a big one. Okay, 60%. And then FCRA got one and state and local got three. So right in the middle. So EEOC the most, state and local, and then FCRA. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, good call, right? Because the EEOC, they tend to be everywhere, right? And there's lots of areas, um, so lots, some subjectivity as well involved in that. And state and local laws, because it's that quick turnaround, that makes a lot of sense. So we're going to talk about how we can stay out of the limelight or the spotlight from these agencies by um, being able to really look at our, our policies and our procedures. So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. She's going to talk through the process. So this is a, kind of a quick view of the screening process that you guys go through um, within the tool reporting platform or your current vendor that you're using. Um, so hold on just one second. There we go. <clears throat> um, so first, so imagine that you have done interviews, you've done all of your research, you have your top candidate for at a high level position. You're ready to move forward and begin the screening process. Um, this is one of the best parts, uh, calling them, offering them job. They get all excited, get their hopes up. It's great. I love that part. So this is um, yes or no, you know, you decline the candidate. You don't need to do anything. Yes, you're moving them to the next steps. So this is where you have the screening process. There's certain laws and regulations that the FCRA has put into place that you have to abide by to protect yourself, to protect your company, and to protect the consumer. The FCRA calls them a consumer, consumer but this is the applicant, the donor, the, um, the potential employee. So we will use that verbiage around this, but know that the consumer is that applicant. Um, so first, you need to disclose your intent to complete a background check. So disclose the intent. You can do this verbally, but best you best case is to do this with, in writing. So if you have a written disclosure, you can track it. You can, if you ever were to have an audit, you can see that you have that disclosure done and they've received it. Um, and then receive consent. So you need to receive consent from the applicant to run the background check. Um, you can't just run a background check willy-nilly on whoever you want. Um, you have to get consent from them to receive that confidential information. And the CRA, which to reporting our point labs is a CRA, you have to provide them with that consent so they know that we can let you see the confidential information as well. And then also you have to provide them with this summary of rights. This summary of rights under the FCRA is, it's four or five page document that goes over their rights as a consumer. So how to dispute if it's inaccurate, how to um, read or uh, want, uh, request a copy of their consumer report, who makes the decision, the hiring decision, all of that data. And then another thing that they need is the screening company information. So if you haven't noticed, all of the documents have the CRA information on it, the phone number, the email, email address, the fax number, everything possible. So they are aware who is running the background check, who is running and giving you that sensitive data. Making sure upfront that information is disclosed and given to the applicant is best case. So there's no surprises. Um, nothing is brought up. So if they do have a record, nothing's like, surprise, we ran a background check on you. You're not going to be hired. Um, everything up front. So once these steps are completed, you've received the authorization, everything, 
is done. Some of the times this is, you know, written consent. And sometimes this is online. You email them and they complete everything online. Then you start waiting for the results to come back. So while we're waiting for those background checks results to come back, let's talk about sensitive data and what is considered sensitive data. Awesome. Yeah, you can see our little joke, right? We're waiting on the <laughs> waiting on the joint yeah. results and the background check results. So yeah, so sensitive information um, is basically defined as anything harmful, embarrassing, or discriminatory that's disclosed or accessed without authorization. So it can be, um, you know, some of the typical information that we're going to ask of for mo from most applicants, right? Which is name, address, social security number, financial and medical information, or any sort of criminal record. The key is that you don't want to be disclosing that without that person being aware or without somebody recognizing that that is personal. That's personal information. It's a personal for a reason. We don't necessarily want, you know, everyone and their dog to know all about our, um, you know, our financial situation or our medical situation or anything that maybe is in our criminal background records that we that we would find embarrassing or maybe discriminatory against us that is not is that something that could be used against us without our knowledge. So we want to be careful with that with that sensitive information and and who is privy to it. And so I actually like haha ha, I think we just got our drug screens back. So I'm going to pass it to Lisa. <laughs> Okay, so as the HR leader, business owner, hiring manager, whomever, we receive the results, um, and now we need to review the results. Just because there's a flag on those results doesn't mean you're not going to hire them. The EEOC, EEOC says that you best practice is to review every single result. Um, your policy should be per position, not just car blanche, yes, no, every position. So let's say they fell the MVR, but they don't drive for your company. Why would that matter for your company? Why would you not hire them if they fell an MVR? Um, could they still be hired and then they're not going to be a driver for your company? You need to look at every position and what criteria meets that position. The EEOC has a guide on hiring practices within backgrounds, background screening, and hiring practices and best cases. It's a great guide that you can look at. And after the webinar, we'll send you a resource list that has that link on it as well that you can look at. So you receive the results, you make the hiring decision based on the results. So yes, you're gonna going to hire them, yay, you let them know, easy peasy. They might request a copy of the check, um, you send them the copy of the consumer report, super easy. If it's a no, you made the decision based on the background screening results. So this time you need to communicate to the candidate. Okay, we received your results. We're making this decision based on these results that we received. We're going to send you a pre-adverse action notification. This pre-adverse action notification has a copy of the background check so they can review it and see what you made the decision on. The best thing when you communicate to the client, the candidate, is to make sure they're aware of the why. If there's a retail theft and they're not being hired for an accounting position, if there is, you know, the reason why they're not hiring based on the background check. If you don't let them know, they're totally confused. They're just going to want to look at their background check and think, okay, why? Um, so have that conversation with them. It might be a difficult conversation. But shortly, Megan's going to give you some tools to have to help have those difficult conversations because it's easier to have that conversation up front instead of them receiving their results and still asking questions. And then they start calling you or calling around your company or calling even us, the CRA, asking questions about the why. It's easier to have that up front and getting an answer from them because it might have um, history to it that might change your decision, or it might be in legal proceedings to have it expunged or removed from their record. So it might have something that makes you change your mind or maybe escalate it to an executive that could turn around the result as well. 
So you send the adverse action notification. This includes a copy of their background check, the summary of rights information again, the contact information of the CRA so they can dispute it. If something just happens to be wrong on that background check, they have um, the rights to dispute it with the CRA. So they will dispute it with us and um, we will open up that case and reconfirm those records. You would be involved in the whole process as well. And then the decision-making responsibility notice. So this is just saying that the CRA did not make the decision that you as a client made the decision and um, we just provided you with the information. So then at that point, you send them the notification and then you provide the applicant with time to review and dispute. So the FCRA says a reasonable amount of time. What is a reasonable amount of time? It really just depends. The EEOC guidelines say three to five business days. So you can go off of that. If you feel like three days for a, a trucker, that doesn't seem fair because they're on the road. Um, so maybe giving them five to seven days would be better. So it's just being mindful of the position and if they are able to review it and dispute it according to you know where they're at or the position. So once you give them that reasonable amount of time, you send them the final adverse action notification. This includes the summary of rights again, the contact information of the CRA, and then who the decision-making responsibility is. That's a one pager, again, that you can send them. And if you need any of these templates, um, we can provide these templates to you. Um, we can provide the disclosures, the authorization, and then we have all the adverse action um, paperwork as well that we can provide you if you need them because a lot of people just don't know the right verbiage to use or what to use, but we can help you work around that if you need to. So once you send that adverse action notification, usually it's it's done, it's over with. They might come back in a few months once the case is dropped or, or something. Know that once they come back, you need to redo the background check. You need to give them a reasonable amount of time um, because that could be dropped. That could be um, just ask questions um, about it because they could have done work to get that removed. So, um, so now we're gonna have a pop quiz. So if you guys, what what is the one key communication disclosure that you always have to send the applicant regarding background checks. Do you guys remember? Your answer in the chat. If you know, I'll give you a little hint. I'll go back to this. That's close, Anna. Um, that's close. It is the um, the summary of rights by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So it's the applicant's summary of rights. Every Everything that's ever sent to the applicant needs to include the summary of rights, um, the consumer summary of rights. Yeah, and Anna, you were half right because you got who yep. it's from, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is the Fair Credit Reporting Act. That's where it came from. Yes, that's, and I actually say it wrong all the time because it is a mouthful. So I, that's perfect. All righty. So uh, you have to have these conversations, right? So Lisa just went over a lot of the steps in the process to make sure that you have the confidence in your process and the way that you're going about uh, checking for background checks and looking at the drug screening results and so that you feel very informed and confident in making those decisions. And now if someone didn't pass that background check um, or drug screen and you have to give them a phone call, you really want to um, you know, get yourself into a position where you feel comfortable doing that. And that's what I wanna talk about for just the next couple minutes. The first here is this quote, right? That we are the professionals, right? Who are delivering this information. And so we need to respond with intelligence, intelligently, right? 
even to unintelligent treatment. And this is a Lao Zhao, um, a Chinese philosopher um, came up with this quote. And that even though there might be somebody who either, either has done something wrong, right? Whatever wrong is, or has some sort of, you know, issue that they're not, maybe not even responding very well, right? Coming up with a, some sort of lame excuse from my, my story at the beginning, we still need to actually respond in an intelligent and professional manner. And so when you have to deliver this bad news, these are some steps to think about and consider, and you can use this as a way to walk through delivering that bad news. And this can actually apply to this specific scenario that we're talking about with delivering results when it comes to the hiring process, or it can actually be applicable to really having to deliver any bad news. If you ever have to terminate someone or someone didn't get a promotion or really any scenario that you can think of where it's, it's not good news and you have to inform someone. The first step is to choose a suitable environment, right? So you don't want to do this, you know, in in you know, in front of an audience in any way, shape, or form. You want to make sure that it's comfortable, right? And that it's quiet. And this can even happen if you're doing it through the phone, right? Like you're doing a phone call, you don't want to have a bunch of noise in the background, or you know, you don't want to be in a place where you're feeling uncomfortable when delivering this news. The second step is to prepare the audience. And this is a little controversial. Some people feel like, oh, I just want to, I, I want to say something positive before I get into the negative. Or, you know, you've heard that sandwich method, like, you know, positive, negative, positive. And I'm actually going to say that when you are delivering bad news, you really don't want to bait and switch anyone. <laughs> you want to kind of get straight to the point. And that's what this is, is bringing up, that you want to say just right off the bat, hey, I have, um, this may be a, a, come to a, as a shock or I have some bad news I, I need to share. Uh, you know, you might already have, you know, you might say to this person, you might already have some apprehension about this. And so I'm gonna get straight to the point. Um, or even just saying something like, okay, this isn't necessarily good news, but I also wanna make sure that it's really clear and that I'm informing you of what, of what came back, right? When it comes to that. So use very clear language, use a neutral tone, Right? You don't want to sound super happy about it when you're delivering bad news. That's a mixed message. And so you also want to pay attention to any sort of facial expression. This is the same with being on the phone as well. If you're you know, smiling and being jovial in your, in your tone and in your way of facial expression, even over the phone, it can be relayed in a, you know, an ingenuine type of way. So make sure that you're being um, very clear, speak clearly, right? and speak calmly, and try to keep that neutral tone. Uh, you don't you don't want to do the upswing, right? That's that's a little bit unprofessional and can sound like you don't you know you're questioning what you're saying, um, and you don't want to try to use all of your you know your new dictionary vocabulary words that you haven't you know practiced yet. You know trying to throw those into the conversation because you know obviously you want to make it really clear and really simple and know your audience. The next step is to break up the information into bite-sized chunks. Okay, you can only process a certain amount of information at a time. So make sure to, you know, kind of, you know, block out. This is, this is what we're going to talk about. This is the information. Here's where you go for questions, right? And just have it very clear and concise as far as the information that you need to have. I like to put some bullet points down um, when I'm having a conversation or delivering something just to make sure I'm covering the bases and I'm making sure that I'm moving along um, and chunking it up. Also, when we tend to get nervous, which sometimes in these types of conversations, we do get nervous. I'm a fast talker in general, but if I'm nervous, I am a freaking speed demon when it comes to talking, right? Because it's a natural thing that when you're nervous, you talk faster. And so recognize that that might be going on when you're in a nervous situation. So slow down, let people process what you're saying and ensure that you're being really clear and concise which is basically the next one, clarify understanding. So when you're talking slow, when you're saying things in a way that is very clear, right? Making pauses for people to absorb the information, um, you know, make sure that that's, you're seeking, making sure that that person leaves that conversation with understanding, especially when it's bad news, right? Because people are a little shocked or they might be trying to process things even a little slower than maybe they would have otherwise. And so the longer and the little bit more patience you can give to clearly making sure that they understand is going to work to your benefit. Um, 
careful of rambling, right? That can also happen when people are nervous. You just kind of start, you know, rambling about all sorts of things and not really staying focused on those bullet points. Or rambling can also be something like bombarding them with information. <laughs> sometimes I feel like I'm doing that. Um, but you know, there's lots to say sometimes and you want to try to get through it. So that that speed and bombarding with a lot of detail, you want to be careful of that as well. Really consider your audience. Who is it that I'm talking with? Um, and what do they need to know at this point in time, right? So thinking about that full process, maybe there is something that they are going to, they're planning to dispute, right? And so just recognize this is what's on the document at this point in time. Don't predict that they're going to be a drug addict for life, right? You don't know. So make sure, I know, make sure that you are thinking about that, what all they need to know at this point in time and not trying to predict the future or describe any sort of future events. The last thing is provide written information. Remember, they're in a little bit of a shock state and they're going to be slow to process. So anything you can do to follow up with them to make sure that the message is clear. Remember, this is in this situation or any other situation, didn't get the promotion or anything like that or a layoff or a termination. Make sure to follow up with some type of written information that can clarify a quick FAQ, some other just summary email, anything like that, that can make sure that people understand and where to go if they have questions, right? That's always a key factor that once they've absorbed a little bit more of the information, they might have questions. So how do they go about doing that? And I just want to point out one other thing. When you're delivering this bad news and you don't want to have it be something that um, is difficult for that, oops, excuse me, sorry. When you are delivering this bad news and you're the professional, you want to do your best to make sure that that person leaves this conversation feeling respected and as a human, and you want to recognize that even if they've made a mistake in their life and that's caused a negative reaction or a negative outcome with them applying for this job or in some other way, not getting the promotion, it doesn't mean that we can't you know, still work with that person in a compassionate, tactful and professional way, okay? So we don't need to try to rush them. We don't need to try to brush them off. They're an actual person that, you know, we want to talk to with that level of respect. And so we can do that with having compassion, right? Really just assuming that there is positive intentions, right? We all make mistakes. We all are in that position. And so really showing that you have concern for yourself and the company, as well as the person that you're talking to. The uh, second one here is to be tactful, right? So this is some people are really good at blatantly telling the truth, right? Tact is when you tell the truth that's considering someone else's feelings, okay? So I can blatantly tell the truth a lot of the time, but do what can I do it with tact, right? Like really making sure that I'm considering someone else's feelings and reactions in the way that I say that. And then the last one is professionalism, right? Really achieving and um, committing yourself to consent consistently deliver the results that you're wanting to and being true to yourself, keeping that high standard of professionalism and meeting those requirements for yourself. All right, I want to share one more quote with you. A boss told me this a long time ago and it's always stuck with me, which is bad news does not get better with time. Okay, even though we might not want to make that phone call, right? I did not want to make that phone call when we first started talking here in this webinar and I had to pick up that phone and tell that guy he didn't get the quality engineering job, right? Um, it didn't get any easier or any better the longer I sat there and waited and stewed on it, right? If anything, it probably got worse. So just recognize that bad news does not get better with time. So get in there, get it done. The sooner, the better, honestly, in almost just about every situation. Be prepared. But the sooner, the better you just kind of get that done, uh, the better it is. All right. Okay, we're going to do a little case study here. So um, this case study is around using AI in the hiring and screening process, right? Might be a little new and upcoming, right? Thought process that we all might have considered. <laughs> so our, our, our pretend company here is called Cutting Edge. 
And they're a company that's really trying to be on the cutting edge, right? Like high technology, like really increasing efficiency. And so what they did is they set up an algorithm um, and you can kind of read along here with me on this slide. Um, they set up an algorithm to really look at their decision-making process in the hiring. And they wanted to weed out the applicants that this is a high demand position, weed out the applicants that really didn't meet those requirements. And so they created the algorithm to select candidates based on their personal data and the data available online, like consumer reports and kind of other resources. They just pulled the internet, right, to kind of help create this algorithm in order to rule out the candidates that weren't going to be effective for the job. And they also actually, just to be overly efficient, they kind of, anyone who applied, pulled the data through the algorithm and then just automatically sent out a notice telling them that they were not um, eligible for the job. So um, a specific candidate was declined um, and automatically informed that they did not, um, were not moving forward in the hiring process, whatever the automatic email said. And they said it was because they had a really, really, um, they required a high credit score and their credit score was too low. So this, you're gonna be dealing with some financial information and they just felt like, yep, you need to be in control of your own finances and do better. And so your credit score was too low. You can't apply for the job any further. So if you are the HR leader, a company owner, um, <laughs> I like, and you receive an email or a voice and a follow-up voicemail. So you receive a couple of contacts from a law firm called You Should Have Known Better. Um, asking about this situation. And I want to know, what would you do? What would you do? Write in the chat what you would do in this situation. Any ideas? Other than panic and hide under your desk or <laughs> um, hurry and quit? <laughs> yeah. What would you do? Anybody noticing what kind of was at fault here, what the situation was that. Absolutely would quit. Yeah. All right, Monica, follow up for more detail. detail. Yeah, you're only hearing a little snippet, so that makes sense. That's a really good first step. Any other thoughts? I would be contacting my attorney. <laughs> general counsel Mike don't answer the email that's a little close to hiding under the desk Mike just saying <laughs> yeah contact my counsel and also disable AI exactly yeah yeah there's so many red flags about this right there um you can't actually have AI pull somebody's personal information first of all that sensitive data right you also don't want AI to not look at individual requirements when it comes to the screening process. That's a best practice from the EEOC, right? Could automatically just be discriminating um, against certain applicants. Plus, um, you just don't want to have a carte blanche rule regarding credit reports, right? Like whatever that might be, you want to be careful of that and just really want to recognize that you want is AI sending all this information with the notices that are required that are allowing people to dispute or doing anything like that? No, it's definitely an efficient way to rule out candidates and it's definitely an illegal way to rule out candidates. So being really careful in this situation. Okay, thanks for playing along. All right, Lisa, or was this me? Um, Overview. This is just the overview of the screening process. And you guys will receive an overview, step-by-step, uh, -step, just workflow of the screening process after this as well with those resource links for um, the EEOC, uh, the FCRA, some other resources that we have put together um, for the hiring process. And then you can also um, let us know if you have any questions, if you need any of the, the disclosures, the authorization forms, anything like that, or any part of this that you have questions on, you can reach out to ArtPoint and we can get back to you on, on those questions. Or if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A too, and we can um, answer them if they're not too direct to regarding your company. 
And here are the actually re additional resources that we will be sending you with the links. So the EEOC um, enforcement guidance, and then what you should know, um, PBSA, the background screening processes, and then the FTC, background checks, what employers need to know, um, the employer background checks and your rights, and then the enforcement guidance. Uh, we will send all those links out for you guys to use as well. Yeah, ArcPoint is a great resource for all of this information. If you have questions and so forth, Lisa's very knowledgeable and the rest of the team. Okay, so summing it up, um, at this point, we've talked through understanding some about the laws and the regulations involved. Hopefully you have some tools to rely on to be a little bit more confident and compassionate and tactful when it comes to delivering bad news. And um, hopefully you feel comfortable at this point to take a bit of a critical look at your screening process and see where your company might want to improve, like where there might just be some gap areas or some areas where you could use some additional guidance. Um, and and see where you might want to reach out for some sort of help, either from our point or from other resources that you can look at to so that you do feel confident um, stepping into those those conversations. And we are going to do a bit of a Q and A, I believe, at this point. Is that true? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah, just so you know, before we jump into the Q&A or while you're getting your last minute questions into the Q&A, I just wanted to say thank you for your time and for listening and my information and contact information there. I, I do a lot of HR consulting. I do a lot of coaching. If there's ever any sort of need or anything like that, feel free to reach out to me. And then Lisa's contact information is there as well. And I'll leave that up for the Q&A. Um, and yeah, let's go jump into that. You guys have any questions? So this is Jamie again. I will actually just ask a question that was asked of me the other day, and I thought you guys could comment on this. So um, can you talk about employers running background checks like before the offer letter is given or if you're doing it after the offer letter? That is something that gets asked, I think, a lot of times. So it depends. It depends on the state or county or city regulations that you are abiding by. So the ban the, ban the box regulations that are coming out make things a little bit more tricky because the ban the box states that you cannot ask about your criminal history before an offer is made because they do what it is, is they want people to have access to job offers not based on your criminal history. So it, asking, hey, do you, can you pass a background check might be illegal in your jurisdiction, depending on where you live. I, in New York, M Massachusetts, those kind of states I know off the top of my head have strict ban the box laws. Austin, Texas is one city that has a ban the box law, not and not Texas as a whole. So know your local ban the box laws, but um total reporting has pre-adverse actions based on if you've made an offer and if you haven't made an offer so you can make you can do a background check on somebody that you haven't made an offer on as long as you have disclosed and have the authorization released um just know your ban the box logs there's a lot of resources out there that have all of the current laws but they are ever changing they are passing them all the time and then resending them because they decide, okay, we don't like this. And then they bring it, pull it back. So just know your regulation um, and be mindful of it. Yeah. And you want to be careful if you have like a, a blanket, like application process or whatever that asks that question and you're not actually looking at the role or the position, mm -hmm. just a little word of advice that you want to be careful that it's, it's not just one system that everybody goes through and that there is some sort of way to filter through by job or at least area or department or something like that. Yes, for sure. And some of them have salary requirements too. If you make over 75,000 or the salary is that, then you can ask certain questions. Um, yeah, great question though, Jamie. I'm glad you brought that up. 
Other questions? Mike, I really hope you have a pillow on your desk if it's that comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, I, if you guys don't have any questions, we can um, end just a little bit early. That email, the follow-up email with the link to this webinar will be coming up here soon. And then the resources as well. Um, I think tomorrow or maybe possibly Monday, I'm not sure how quick it takes to have this uh, webinar video put into the email and everything. But feel free to reach out to Megan or um, myself or ArcPoint if you have any questions any, about anything. And um, I, I hope you guys all have a great weekend. Yeah, have a great weekend. Thanks for participating. Thanks for chiming in on the chat. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye.